And we're live, I believe. Hello, good afternoon. A very warm welcome to today's FireX Connect uh, Strat Talk, which will focus on the highly topical and extremely relevant subject of evacuating tall buildings. This FireX Strat Talk is sponsored by Securiton AG, and we're extremely grateful to them for helping us bring this discussion to you today. Securiton has a booth on the Connect Meetings platform, so please ensure that you visit their booth and see the wide range of fire detection and alarm solutions they have on offer. And if you want to discuss these in greater depth, please make use of the meetings facilities or the business card drop-off function. The challenges of, of tall buildings in the fire safety community have been a, a constant focus uh, for many decades, but it, it was the Grenfell um, Tower fire in 2017 that revealed the complexities and, and seriousness of maintaining a compliant fire safety building alongside a strategy to evacuate a building of this type in an emergency situation. As we've seen and heard through the current inquiry, an event of this magnitude poses many questions around building control, public safety, construction methods, and emergency response. And we've subsequently witnessed the government has responded with far reaching horizontal reviews and guidelines and legislation. The review and investigation delivered by the Hackett Report in June 2018 highlighted over 50 recommendations for government to create a more robust regulatory framework with a strong focus on key areas such as uh, design, compliance, construction methods and ongoing building management. And there were some strong opinions aired by Dame Judith Hackett throughout the report, but perhaps the most telling was, and I quote, there is a need for a radical rethink of the whole system and how it works. And this is most definitely not just a question of the specification of cladding systems, but of an industry that has not reflected and learned for itself, nor looked to other sectors. And with regards to building standards in the construction sector, Dame Judith said there was an attitude of viewing minimum standards in the approved documents as a high bar to be negotiated down, rather than genuinely owning the principles of a safe building and meeting the outcomes set out in the regulations. Uh, with due respect to the ongoing inquiry, this discussion will not focus on the Grenfell fire, but it will give us an opportunity to look at the impacts on building control, potential changes to legislation, new codes of practice and general approaches to emergency evacuation from a technology and operational standpoint. So just to introduce everybody taking part today, I'm Jerry Dunphy from FireX International. I'm your host and moderator, and I'm delighted to be joined by Russ Timpson. Managing Director of Crisis Boardroom and the Tall Buildings Fire Safety Network. Good afternoon, Russ. Good afternoon, Jerry. Also, um, Andrew Scott, who's the Project Director at CTEC. Good afternoon, Andy. Hi, Jerry. And finally, good afternoon to Richard Clark, who's a Senior Fire Engineer from the National Fire Chiefs Council. Good afternoon, Richard. Good afternoon, Jerry. Fantastic and welcome all. Um, if I may, I'll ask all of you to uh, give a little bit background to your roles and expertise, particularly relevant to today's discussion on evacuating tall buildings. So I'll start with Russ. So Russ, could you just give us a bit of background about yourself, please? Yeah, uh, so I'm a, um, I'm a former firefighter and um, went out into industry after I did my degree. I'm a chartered fire engineer and uh, working with colleagues, got interested in tall buildings and fire safety back in 2009. Um, found that there wasn't really a, um, a discussion community in the UK for tall building fire safety issues. So started a thing called the Tall Buildings Fire Safety Network, which since then we've, in conjunction with, with uh, you know, um, with uh, you, Jerry, we've run a number of international conferences and I'm currently involved at a number of levels at some initiatives, including high-rise firefighting, but obviously dealing with some of the issues that we're going to be talking about today. So uh, um, and coming at this from an international context, the picture behind me is a development in Chongqing in China. Uh, so it's interesting to see how other countries around the world are looking at these challenges and uh, the solutions that they're coming up with. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Russ. Um, now over to you, Andy, if you could just uh, introduce yourself, please. Yes, I'm the uh, projects director at CTEC and CTEC manufactures commercial fire alarms. But about 12 years ago, we invented a thing called a hush button which took us into the domestic fire alarm business. Um, and consequently, when Grenfell Tower happened, we, we were obviously interested to see which way legislation and guidance would go. Um, and we, uh, we started to look at, at everything that was happening. 
And when we heard that the S8629 was being published, we took a, a great interest in seeing whether or not we could produce a compliant product, which we did, uh, I have to say, very quickly. Um, and uh, the other expertise that I bring to it, of course, is that I have worked in standards for 20 odd years in both BSI and in SEN. So got an understanding of how the mechanics of standards work. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, Andy. And Richard, over to you, please. Hi, Jerry. Um, yeah, I've been in fire safety regulation for 15 years now. Um, I did a fire engineering degree just over 10 years ago, and I'm currently seconded into the National Fire Chiefs Council as part of something called the Building Safety Programme Team, which was put together to represent the fire services in uh, throughout the legislative change that's ongoing at the moment. Marvellous, and, and thank you all once again. So just to explain, uh, today's discussion will, will be a deep dive into the, uh, the current approaches to evacuating tall buildings, uh, the challenges faced by fire safety professionals, the technological solutions helping to assist these challenges, and the impacts of potential changes in legislation. The session is interactive, and we really want to hear your thoughts and views on today's discussions. So to engage, in the Q&A, please submit a, a question by the top right-hand side Q&A box on your screen. And if you have a question for a specific panelist, please address the question to them and we'll make sure it's directed to the relevant person. And don't forget, through the FireX Connect platform, you can search and visit the virtual booths for fire safety manufacturers, industry associations, inspectorates and approvals bodies to view their products and services and arrange subsequent meetings following this discussion. It's a unique opportunity to catch up with industry leading manufacturers and organizations to hear about their latest solutions and discuss their products. Lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please type any issues into the chat box and one of the technical team will be on hand to support you. And if you'd like to watch the webinar back or you have any internet issues during the session, don't worry, this will be available to watch back on demand throughout uh, June and July. It's being recorded, so please feel free to log back on anytime and you can catch up between meetings on the platform to watch at your leisure. So we'll move on to the discussion with the panel. And if I may, um, I'll, st I'll start with you, Andy, because you kindly produced um, and provided a brief overview of uh, BS 8629-2019, um, which is an important new standard, which introduces a new technological solution for building evacuation. Um, BS 8629 sets out requirements for um, evacuation alert systems, which I believe are called EAS, am I right, Andy? Um, to be used by the Fire and Rescue Service in the event of, of emergencies in apartment blocks. So Andy, if I can ask you to share your screen and I'll hand over the, the comm to you um, and please, um, could you just present the findings um, behind uh, BS8629. So over to you, Andy. Thanks very much. Certainly. Okay. Um, yes, BS8629. This is a 40 minute presentation cut down to five. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them in the uh, discussion later on. Um, the first thing to notice, the term of it, alert has been used instead of alarm. This was done deliberately because this is not a normal form of fire alarm system. And by that, it's, uh, what we mean is that it doesn't have any detection in it, which I'll come to later. These systems are legally required in Scotland in new residential buildings over 18 metres. Uh, this is because the Scottish Government passed legislation uh, to that effect after Grenfell Tower. Um, and the standard was actually written initially entirely for that need. So it wasn't written with the rest of the UK in mind. Uh, however, the Grenfell Tower inquiry then recommended that EAS should be fitted in all new and also all existing high rise residential blocks. Um, it also raised the question of what is high rise, because the definition at the moment is 18 meters, and there is a possibility that it may change to 11 meters. I believe that is the safe working height for the ladder on a normal fire tender, although Russ will probably know a lot more than I do about that. Um, so they're not a legal requirement in the rest of the UK. However, I have been told that they uh, will be going in the building regulations in due course. Again, people may have some more up-to-date information on that. So, as I said before, there's no automatic fire detection. The controls for operating the alert sounders are manually operated. 
by the Fire and Rescue Service if they think the stay pottle to see no longer works or if they have some other problem um, with the system. There also is no whole building evacuation control. There's no big red button that, evacu that operates the sounders throughout the building. Um, that was a deliberate choice. Um, it was decided that they did not want, under any circumstances, to operate all the sounders at the same time. Um, the, the EACIE, the Evacuation Alert Control and Indicating Equipment, is installed in a very secure cabinet. Uh, now, some people have commented that this is not necessary, vandalism isn't a problem in their block and so forth. What I've been told is that this is not just about vandalism, this is about avoiding anybody being able to deliberately operate the sounders um, for whatever reason. Um, so the box is very tough um, and the key is also um, highly secure. Um, however, despite different manufacturers uh, having products in the, in the uh, market, uh, they all have to have a consistent appearance. And that's a totally logical thing which we support. Um, the switch operation and layout is clearly defined um, so that the fire and rescue service, it doesn't matter which product they get to, they can operate it safely. So that's the first slide. Other differences, um, what's are the differences with the normal fire alarm? Well, the first thing is the wiring. With a normal fire alarm system, the sound is in each flat, the wiring would simply go in and out of each flat. Um, the risk with that is that if the fire spreads vertically and two or more flaps are affected, you could end up with sounders uh, not operating on the whole floors, all the floors that are affected. So the solution to that is what is called spurred wiring, protected wiring spurs, which is not how a normal fire alarm would be wired. Um, maintenance installation is really important. These systems have to be able to work uh, when they're needed um, and they're not expected to be used very frequently. So there is a, uh, a certification scheme for contractors, BAFE SP207, which can be used to um, show compliance and competence. Uh, one subject that's uh, very uh, topical at the moment is the alarm systems for waking watch, the temporary alarm systems. Uh, and we get asked if these can be converted into 8629 systems. And the answer is yes, but you need to plan it at the original installation uh, if it's going to be done economically. Um, as far as the alert sounds, the cells are concerned, the standard says one sounder is all that is normally needed in a flat. Um, so that can be literally just over the entrance door. Uh, however, it does say it should be possible to add alert devices for the hard of hearing. So that could be more sounders, that could be visual alarm devices, that could be vibrating pads, or it could be pages, anything of that description. So that is my very brief summary. Uh, and then just the final thing is just a diagram for the technically minded amongst you to show the wiring. This is just two floors. Obviously, this system wouldn't go in a two story building. And these are what are called short circuit isolators that protect the wiring in all directions against short circuits. And that is it. Is that okay? Brilliant, thanks Andy, yeah, that, that's really good. I'll try um, and find the unshare button now, shall I? <laughs> there we go, perfect, thanks for that. As, um, I think it's incredibly timely and topical because obviously, you know, this is a, this is a standard that's 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 been introduced. Why why do you think it's come through? Is that was there input from the Fire and Rescue Service to to actually look at this particular type of technology? No, simply the Scottish. My understanding um, from the guy who was very much involved in the original drafting uh, was that this was done under contract for the Scottish government when they changed their law to bring the requirement in. In fact, they didn't expect that there would be met very many systems installed every year if it was just high rise residentials over 18 meters in Scotland. Um, it, 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 it wasn't written with the, uh, with the English market in mind uh, originally. However, work has already started, preliminary work started on a revision. So, right. so that's, that's happening. 
Excellent. And, uh, and has the Fire and Rescue Service been involved? I, mean, I, I noticed you said that. I, I believe very much, very much so. My work in standards is uh, with FSH 12, which is alarm devices. Uh, this was actually done, to, uh, done under FSH 17, uh, which uh, I can't actually remember the exact title, but it is the fire officers themselves. It's the fire brigades requirement equipment for firefighting. Um, so uh, it was it was very much involved and a lot of things like the, the high security cabinet were, were requirements by the fire service and also I believe the police um, who were very concerned to make sure that these things didn't cause more problems than they solved. So you're right and presumably would there be training as well I mean for building owners and, and the fire service because it is a, a bit of a departure from the standard alarm system isn't it? There is training for the fire and rescue service. There is a, a fire and rescue service have a website uh, which they've just recently um, set up for their own people. Um, and it is possible to log on to that website and see the training. And it's a, it's a typical modular quest Q and A training program with pictures of equipment and explanations of the background and when it might be needed. It's very thorough actually, very Excellent. thorough. And I suppose in, a, in an emergency situation, um, I presume there's a, there's, a, there's a human decision involved, isn't there, here as to when to engage? Yes. Is, is there any steer, Richard, from, from, from you guys as to when would you look to engage it? Because I'd not, imagine it's not, a go-no-go no -go situation. Not, not our place. Mm. <laughs> I think the Fire and Rescue Service would be very upset if we were telling them when to use it. Um, but the simple answer I, I, I used to give when we first got into this was that it was for uh, just when stay put fails, an absolute last resort. Um, since looking at the, um, the training from the uh, NFCC, they've actually got a list, I think, of about 15 or 20 times when it might be used. I can't remember the details, but for instance, if they just can't get the resources to the building, I remember that one. Um, you know, if I, I imagine this, what they're saying there is if there's another shout in, in, in nearby and they literally don't have the resources at that moment, they might use the system preemptively. Um, but uh, not our decision, down, in, absolutely down to operational decision making. Of course, yeah. And, you, and you've mentioned, um, you've mentioned stay put there. Richard, can you just, um, would you be able to just explain again, you know, the, the ethos behind stay put and and, and why it's it seems such a standard procedure. Yes, uh, stay put is kind of uh, enshrined in building design codes from kind of the 1960s onwards with CP3. And the idea is that if you have a fire in your flat, then of course you should evacuate, you should alert everybody else and exit your flat into the common areas. But the building design, with things like the fire resistance and compartmentation involved should allow others in that building to stay in their um, areas of demise order, you know, they're flat themselves without being negatively affected immediately by the fire. So it might be that there's some smoke enters the means of escape as the ten as the persons in the fire of origin flats exit, but that should be um, able to be got rid of by either natural ventilation or the mechanical ventilation in the area. So essentially it's kind of like having um, separate houses in the sky turn on its edge and the fire resistance should mean that a fire in one flat shouldn't really affect the others within a reasonable time limit. And I suppose it, over the years it, it, it has proved to be an effective measure. Yeah, um, most buildings have had a stay put uh, design enshrined in them for, yeah, as I mentioned, since the 1960s, that's how most of our building design codes are designed to the moment. And with the um... Andy, with the premises information box, um, does that also fulfill its original purpose as well? So would you keep the building details in the box with the EAS or would you need a separate one? Sorry, you're on mute. I was coughing earlier, so I thought it better. Um, yes, it, it, the, the PIB is, as far as we're concerned, nothing to do with the alarm system, the alert system. Um, the only thing, the only relationship is that the main manufacturer of the rather sturdy cabinets is the main manufacturer of premises information boxes. Um, all I'm aware of is that they are a place where the building information it will be stored, plans, 
details of uh, smoke ventilation systems and of course controversially perhaps peeps but uh, I, I, I'm not entirely sure where that one is up to at the moment. Peeps personal emergency evacuation plans. Right of course of course um, and one thing you did mention in the presentation was around um, and this will be quite controversial is around the waking watch. Um, you, you did mention that you, you could kind of in, incorporate the technology um, in, into the sort of the waking watch scenario. Could, well, could you explain the, how that the, would work? The, the NFCC recommendation for um, not needing to have waking watch is to put heat detectors um, in the rooms adjacent to any windows that let onto cladding, onto flammable cladding. Uh, so that is a form of conventional fire alarm system that will be wired in whatever way was most suitable following the normal um, requirement recommendations of BS 5839 part one. Um, so the main thing to take into account if they wanted to uh, convert it later to an EC, uh, sorry, to an EAS would be uh, to do the wiring in a way that's suitable for the EAS, uh, but operationally have it functioning as uh, an, an alarm system. Uh, whether it's a good idea or not, um, well, obviously, people who have been uh, having to pay a lot of money for waking watch and alarm systems, uh, it, it's terrible that, 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 that this should be, we should be in this position. But I, I do not see an alternative to it at the moment. Mm. And, and Richard, with, with waking watch, I mean, it was introduced as a, as a temporary measure. Do, do, do you know if there's a, is a guidance on the time span for this? Uh, so the simultaneous evacuation guidance, which has been written in conjunction with other partners as well, um, does outline the idea that waking watch should only ever be used in the short term. And the idea is that it's in place to enable the blocks of flats to be occupied in the interim period between kind of being able to identifying the risk to the building and then being able to install a column and fire alarm system to it. Um, it's only used in premises where the idea, well, where the risk of ex kind of rapid fire spread on the exterior of the building, so on the uh, cladding system, uh, is deemed to be so dangerous that it's, yeah, there is a very real risk to people in there. So a waking watch is kind of like a human fire alarm in the sense that it's there to patrol, detect if there are any fires, and then raise the alert to residents. Perfect. Um, so I've got some questions coming through. Um, Quite a few actually on the EAS, um, Andy. Here's a quick one. Does it need to be retrofitted, I presume? Um, well, because it's not a legislative requirement, the answer is legally, it doesn't need, to, you don't need to do anything. Um, however, um, if it does become a legal requirement for new buildings, then I dare say people will look for consistency across their estates. Um, but I think no matter what happens, it's a risk assessed decision. Whether, whether something like this should be installed in existing buildings. Um, right. Having said that, we have lot, an awful lot of inquiries and an awful lot of orders coming in for these systems in existing buildings. So clearly a lot of people think they are a good idea. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Russ, I appreciate your patience. You've been sat there for a little while. Um, there's a question come from you actually directly, which is related to um, to, to stay put actually. So from your experience, um, how, how does the stay put policy compare to other country standards around the world? Uh, stay put, remain in place, protect in place, it's called different things in different continents. It's by far away the most commonplace uh, approach to uh, people in high rise residential buildings. Um, Interestingly, we had an event recently listening to German colleagues. They were surprised to know that you would be giving people this instruction. They said it's, you know, we, we people are at liberty to make their own decision about whether they stay in the building or leave the building. So we don't actually enshrine it in something called stay put. It's just if you if you think you should leave the building, you should leave the building. It's entirely up to the resident to do it. Um, in other countries, um, they, they are quite clear that, yes, that they, they, they don't want everybody leaving the building uh, at the same time. Um, we, we, we've taken it to its logical extension as a formal policy because, obviously, as a fire engineer, you know, I will design the evacuation staircases and things 
bearing in mind that that is the, the, the strategy that's taking place. Now, unfortunately, that means if we do end up switching fire strategies, which is the new reality that we're dealing with, that you may have an end up in a situation where the facilities are perhaps inadequate for that, that change. And, and that's the, the nub of the, uh, the issue for us at the moment. Um, we, 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 we build a lot of tall buildings, tall residential buildings with a single staircase. Um, that's, that's the norm in our country. Um, other colleagues around the world are quite surprised at, at that reality. Uh, when, when, when I tell them that, that, they simply wouldn't allow it in other countries. Um, so, you know, it, it is, we have formalized it, we have adopted it in all of our codes and structures, and we, we've then equipped buildings with the commensurate escape routes based on the fact that there's only going to be small numbers of people leaving. Um, if a lot of people have to leave suddenly, then there are question marks. Super. I think um, this is a, a good juncture actually to, to pass the pass the baton over to you. So um, I know you've got some some slides as well, which will, will underpin what we're talking about. So can I can I pass control to you and you share your screen for the next few minutes, please? Yes. Um, I hope you can see my slide it says when there's evacuation transit to rescue. Can you see that? Okay, great stuff. Um, I'll start with this first slide. Um, and this really encapsulates it for me. I, I'm an engineer, I love graphs. Um, on this diagram here, you can see <clears throat> the, the line C represents the level of safety that's the, the, the uh, approved document B in England and Wales represents. Uh, the line above it is, 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 is an enhanced level of safety, which perhaps the insurers may request. And then, um, this is my opinion, of course, but line A probably represents what the residents actually think they want level of safety. Um, in my experience and from what I'm seeing for, for reports coming across my desk, line D is the actual as-built level of safety. Um, and you can see there that in my experience, it declines over time. Um, so in my opinion, we've got a bit of a reality gap. Um, um, and unfortunately, a lot of the conversations that we're having are based on a datum of C um, and I don't think that's I don't think that's representative of, of the real datum, certainly when we're talking about this type of work. Um, so, you know, and it goes not just stay put, but it also goes into buildings that are operating high rise buildings that are operating phased evacuation where you only you only evacuate, you know, uh, two or three floors when there's a fire. Um, you know, we know that those types of buildings are probably going to operate with uh, um, pressurized staircases and those pressurization systems are, are normally based on only a number of a, a finite number of doors being opened well if, if we get phased switched to simultaneous then all the doors are going to be opened and that draws into question marks about the efficacy of the system um, I, I, and i am worried certainly with stay put when stay put turns to simultaneous about the risks that people are going to run if they're in congested staircases and we've got contra flow with firefighters trying to come up the stairs um, and I think also we have to bear in mind human behavior, you know, social media, uh, the use of social media and also the media itself. I saw a case study recently of a fire in Toronto where they had a helicopter, the TV crew, it was a serious fire in a high rise. And the reporter said, I think those people should be getting out of the building now. And you can imagine if people are watching the television, they'll suddenly decide to self evacuate. So I, I think there are, there are a number of reasons why you know, the, 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 the concept of stay put may, may change very quickly. And I, I, and I really have serious concerns as to, as to what that's going to do when that happens. Um, um, we, we know that we've got, there's going to be a need to change evacuation strategies. I think it's foreseeable. We've got to implement that change process. So 8629 is very much part of that change process. We've got the building safety bill which is coming down the track, which is going to put on lots of requirements for people. Um, and if we look back and reflect on, you know, these three fires in the past, uh, the Lacrosse building in, in, in Melbourne um, and the Address Hotel in, in Dubai, and then compare that with, with, with the Grenfell, um, where we had obviously a significantly different outcome. Uh, and, and we need to ask ourselves in this country, why, why was that change or that, that different in outcome? Um, um, and I think that's 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 reasonable to ask that question. Um, 
So why should you change your evacuation strategy? Well, your fire risk assessment may reveal design or inherent construction failures, going back to my graph at the start. Um, a major change to the building structural geometry or occupant profile. A fire that occurs that does not conform to the design fires that the fire strategy was based upon. Typically, you know, lots of our codes and standards are based on a five megawatt fire. Forgive me if that doesn't mean anything to some of the people on this call, but um, you know, we, we base a lot of our codes on fires in starting inside compartments. Um, if the fire doesn't start in the compartment, then um, the codes don't necessarily fit, is my contention. Uh, and then we've got the human behavior element I've said with social media, et cetera. Um, you know, we know that uh, there's been countless examples now of fires not remaining in the compartment or the floor of origin. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, again, there was another one recently, only only this month in uh, in Abu Dhabi, where we had a full height ascending wall fire. Well, the codes and standards were never written to cope with that kind of fire scenario. Um, um, a human behaviour, you know, he, he, this is from a fire in New York. What would you do if you were looking out the window and you saw that? Would you stay put? I don't think you would. You'd leave and you'd get out the building. So, I think we have to. As fire engineers and people in this, we have to sometimes put ourselves in the shoes of the residents and not necessarily look at this as a sterile engineering activity. Um, and that does, if we do change, it's a massive challenge to the fire service. Um, so we've seen the development of these kind of new messages that the fire service are using, where they're going to switch fire evacuation strategies, you know, in the midst of a fire. Uh, and, I, and I think we're putting an almost impossible challenge out to firefighters when that happens in order to do that in an effective way, in a safe way, not only for the residents, but for the firefighters themselves. Um, so, you know, post Grenfell, it is foreseeable that you'll need to change your evacuation during a fire incident. This adaptability has got to be considered and the facilities like 8629 have got to be provided. Um, it's a major change and um, I think it's, it's foreseeable and, and we should be reflecting that in, in, in risk assessments, etc. Um, what else can we consider? There's a few ideas here. We know that smoke hoods are being used now. I think there's a legitimate question now to be asked about in certain buildings which we've got identified legacy issues. Should the, should the residents be issued with smoke hoods? I know the NFCC are clearly against that and I understand the reasons why. Uh, it's commonplace in many parts of the world now. Um, staying in hotels across Asia, every room is equipped with a smoke hood. Um, Smoke curtains in the middle there. Lots of UK brigades now are um, experimenting with, with, with smoke curtains on doors. Um, the, the photograph on the top right there, that's, that's giving real time information to people in evacuation stairs. And, and the picture on the bottom right there, that's an evacuation welfare kit from Japan uh, with things like water and a smoke mask and, and torches, etc. So I think all of these, we, sh we should look outside the UK. There's plenty of great ideas uh, out there. Um, Pre-planning, mass communication, social media. We've got to be able to talk to everybody in the building to make this work, not just 8629. It's got to be some way that we can give them information. I think we really are going to be asking neighbours to be buddies when we start talking about peeps. Obviously, correct use of the premise information box, evacuation apps, rally points. We've got to get people away from the building because we know that tall buildings, when they catch fire, we have a debris field. We have an impact zone where debris falling off the building. Um, uh, and we need to think about the occupants. If, if, we, if we're going to decant the occupants out of the building and they're not going back in, some of them may be vulnerable, they may need medication, they may need all other kind of things. All of this needs to be planned for, which, which really we haven't done thus far when we're talking about stay put. So lots of work to do, in my opinion. Um, yeah, and an appeal from me, and I think uh, fortunately Andy covered it, the 8629 systems, I think they are part of the answer, but they've got to be implemented and installed as part of a change process involving all the stakeholders. Um, it's a very quick run through. Um, um, but anyway, I will now try and stop, uh, stop sharing. Hopefully that's food for thought. Uh, that's fantastic, Russ. In fact, um, you've, you've, you've got some questions coming in as well um, because of that. But one thing you've, you've said, and I think um, I'll ask you and Richard uh, jointly, something that you've thrown into the mix, which I don't think anyone's ever really considered, is how, how do you manage the noise around social media, particularly for an incident? That must be so difficult, particularly for, for the fire and rescue service. How, how, in, in this day and age, how do, you, how do you get through it, I suppose? How do you cut through the noise that's going on? 
Well, I think you have to, in my opinion, you have to establish an authoritative channel to talk to the residents. Now, there's a very good chance that in, in some blocks that I'm dealing with now, there, there's a strong community sense in the building. They have WhatsApp groups and they have Facebook groups, etc. cetera. Um, you know, through a tenant engagement strategy, you need to connect to those um, so that you are have got a, a discrete audience and you, you're limiting the number of people that can contribute to that. But, you know, it's easy enough for anybody to go onto a community group and say there's a fire on the second floor. Everybody better get out. Um, and, you know, a lot of the occupants probably will get out, irrespective of whatever the, the evacuation strategy is. So I think that's a reality. And it's overlooked when we're looking at this as a very sort of uh, engineering issue. We really should blend in the, the human behavior aspect to this as well. Yeah, and Richard, without putting you on the spot, obviously, is, is, is that something that the, the fire chiefs maybe are, are, are you aware of or is it is it a working group that's that's currently in play? In terms of resident messaging. Um, and social media and, and modern day distractions, I suppose. I have to say it's not something that I'm aware of. That's not to say it's not happening. It's just not within the sphere that I'm dealing with. I mean, it is a, an issue in terms of operational planning because if you're more likely to expect people to... Um, to be involved more with kind of trying to self-evacuate as an incident progresses and that's something that has to be accounted for and that needs to also be taken account of in things like building design because um, at the moment Russ mentioned most of our buildings are designed around a single staircase which does make offer challenges for kind of trying to fight an operational incident whilst others potentially want to evacuate down the single staircase which may be becoming kind of smoke logged as part of that incident so it's Absolutely, in fact, be considered in future. The building design. Yeah, in, in, indeed. I mean, that's a question, Russ, that's come through to you. Um, it, it's where a high-rise building has a single staircase. What are the thoughts about pressurising that staircase? Well, it's a legitimate uh, technique. Um, uh, very careful what I say here. Um, it's an advanced technique which needs very careful installation, very careful commissioning and very careful maintenance and checking. Uh, I saw recently a smoke control system, a video of a smoke control system, which had been vandalized um, and a staircase had been pressurized and a firefighter, a big strong firefighter had to put their boot on the wall and put all their weight against the door to open it against the, the pressure. Um, now we know that the door opening pressure shouldn't exceed hundred Newtons. Uh, and this was way in excess of hundred Newtons. Um, so those, those, those systems in a fire strategy written by a fire engineer, they tick the box for building control. They absolutely tick the box. My concern is that they are systems that need a lot of care and maintenance to install and commission correctly. And post commissioning, they need to be checked and tested regularly. Um, and you need to look at some of the design assumptions. How many doors is that system designed to be open for? Now, it may be a finite number of doors. If we get a simultaneous and all the doors are open, what does the system do then? How effective is it? Indeed. Um, so another question just coming actually, it's about the Waking Watch Relief Fund. Um, do we know how many buildings have actually used the relief fund so far? And Andy, this is probably one for you. How do we ensure the system's installed with fit for purpose after? Which was going to come on to something I was going to ask you about the competency angle. So is it, it one thing you said in the presentation, um, is it mandatory to have a content installed, particularly the one that's, that's BAFE registered? Well, you've got to be very careful with the word mandatory because BSX 629 is a code of practice. So it gives recommendations. Uh, so nothing in it is mandatory. Um, it is recommended that you use a competent installer. It is recommended that you use a uh, competent maintenance organisation. Um, that's why I mentioned BAFE because they provide a method of measuring competence. Um, and it, all I would say is, from what I've seen of the way responsibility is going to go, that if you're responsible for the fire safety and you've used some chap from around the corner who could do it cheaper, um, then you know, hopefully you'll uh, reap the consequences if something should go wrong. Absolutely, and do we know, just part of that question, do we know how many buildings have used the Waking Watch Fund so far? Is, is there a register of that? Just throwing that open to the I'm panel. Not aware. I'm just looking on the um, 
gov.uk website there is a page devoted to it i'm not sure about exact numbers one one thing i would like to mention russ mentioned simultaneous evacuation a couple of times uh, what i don't understand is why we go from no form of evacuation to emptying the whole building all in one go evacuation alert systems don't do that they they do it on a floor by floor basis manually selected automatic alarm systems don't need to do that either um, and, and, and haven't done that in commercial systems for many years. So it's called phased evacuation. Everybody's heard of it, but it doesn't seem to be on the agenda. Um, you know, there may be cases where it's not appropriate, but I, I don't understand why it isn't being discussed. Can I just respond to that, uh, Jerry? Uh, you're absolutely right, Andrew. And uh, we're all familiar and comfortable with progressive horizontal evacuation in things like hospitals, etc. And in fact, in Asia, progressive vertical evacuation is also commonplace to refuge floors or mm -hmm. sky lobbies, as they call them in, in China and other places. Um, but I think we, you know, going back to my earlier point, we have to recognize the human behavior in this. And that despite having phasing systems and phased uh, evacuation signals, despite all of the technology and all of the intent of the designers and the fire engineer, you may well still end up in a simultaneous evacuation because of human behavior. Um, and yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think that's absolutely valid, but um, telling everybody all at once, get out now, and having everybody obey is different to telling some people get out now and having some other people also sure. think they should get out. And, sure. and I, I, think can't see, I can't see any, there's very few occasions where you're going to ask everybody to get out at the same time. And yeah. I'll tell you, there, there, ain't, there, there aren't many buildings that are designed for that these days. Uh, and certainly would the stair, the stair capacity wouldn't take it. Yeah. I think in the context of the simultaneous evacuation guide, it's the change from the stay put to that strategy is just because of the risk of the exterior of the building. Um, you know, it might take longer than that for actually everybody to get out. So simultaneous is probably going to be not quite the same as kind of sounding the alert in a shop and everybody coming out all at the exact same time. It will be no, but no, but it would be perfectly yeah. reasonable to evacuate the floor of fire and the floors above, uh, even though if that was the ground floor, that would be the whole building. Um, if it mm. was the 13th floor, as it was uh, uh, last month, um, it, it, it would only be the floors above. Um, and and uh, I, I just don't understand why that has been left out of the guidance, but hey. Um, a question's come in actually, which is, um, I suppose this is quite controversial, but I'm gonna put it in here, is, um, isn't part of the problem that there's no consistent approach between building control and fire authorities in England and Wales? Who wants to pick that one up? <laughs> I suppose they have a point, I mean, uh, I, I, I look at this always as a, as I say, a civilian, um, because you just, I suppose, civilians make assumptions all the time about consistency of approach. So um, would that be a valid question? I think the question would be consistency of approach with regard to what? Um, uh, between building control and fire authorities, there's no consistent approach. Um, I mean, we are doing work with regard to the building regulations and fire safety procedural guidance, which has been updated. There is a um, pro forma within that, with the idea of uh, it should be filled out, specifying what information has been looked at as part of the um, building control process. Um, yeah, I think you've got a situation where you've got over 40 different fire and rescue services speaking to over 300 different building control bodies um, within the country there will be inconsistencies. It's difficult to kind of answer that question without actually knowing specifically to what they're referring to, if that makes sense. Um, of course, yeah. And I suppose as well, you, you know, what's going on at the moment with the, the Building Safety Bill coming through and the, the Fire Safety Act, can you actually, and Richard, this is to you in particular, what, what impacts do you think the, particularly the recent Fire Safety Act has had on existing fire safety legislation? Can you give us an overview of what's what's principally changed? Um, well, it's kind of the clarification. So the main thing now is that when carrying out a fire and risk, fire risk assessment of a high rise residential building, the risk assessor would need to consider the external facade of the building itself. So the issues with regard to um, 
certainly when I was a, an inspecting officer, you to get risk assessments, which would say we've inspected the common areas, but that's it. They wouldn't necessarily even look at the flat fire doors. Now the fire risk assessment would have to look at um, the exterior and the interior potential for fire spread as part of it. Um, and obviously, you know, with the new directions and new guidance, there's still a, a reliance upon the accountable person, responsible person, everything else. Is there a risk in that approach, inherent risk in that approach? Because you're asking once again civilians to kind of make judgment calls on these things. Um, I suppose the idea is that um, the new regime is reliant on competent people being involved. So if a responsible person doesn't feel that they have the understanding to accurately assess these things, they should be engaging a competent person as part of that. So there's lots of work going on. Um, certainly part of the industry response group, working groups looking at competency of various sectors to kind of try and outline who should be working on what. Um, Andy mentioned things like the BAFE schemes for third party accreditation. It's really to look for people who actually have undergone that kind of training and are willing to be assessed to show that they know what they're doing when we look at things like that. And where, and Andy, I suppose as well, from a manufacturer's point of view, um, where, where, where do you see uh, particularly competency and approvals and products, what, what role does this have moving forward? Because obviously there's, there is now a focus and a spotlight on construction products. Where well, do you see that moving? Well, from a, from a fire alarm point of view, we already have very strong regulation on the majority of products. Uh, the EM54 series of product standards. Um, the, the, so we're sort of a bit confused as to why the rest of the world has been, uh, has, has not had this level of regulation. I mean, my company is relatively small. We regularly spend more than a million pounds a year on certification of products, without which we cannot legally place them on the market. Um, and, and I hear, you know, I listen to the Grenfell Inquiry podcasts uh, and I hear the cladding manufacturers talking about £20,000 here and £20,000 there. And I'm just, it's what? It's nothing. If you want to be in this market, if we want to be in the market of fire alarm equipment, we have to spend, invest that money. Why does the rest of the building not need to invest in safety? Don't, under, don't understand. Hope nobody disagrees with that one. <laughs> I think we have we have a general concurrence. Um, sorry, Andy, I've got another question that's coming for you. It's directly to do with the um, the uh, EAS. Um, the detection in apartments is it full coverage or is it just one detector per apartment? There are no detectors. There are no fire detectors whatsoever. That's the answer. There is one sounder or more, and and the more will relate to achieving the sound pressure levels. That are required, which are the same as for BS5839 Part 6 residential and BS5839 Part 1. Um, and there may be, if you have somebody who has impaired hearing, uh, they may need extra help, a warning. Um, but for instance, putting a flashing light of that by the front door, if that's in a lobby, would be pointless <laughs> if the door's closed and they can't see it. Um, so it requires thought, but the, 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 there is no detection. It's absolutely a manual system. Perfect. Thanks for that. Good for, good, good for clarification. Um, with there was an incident um, earlier this year in London at New Providence Wharf. Um, I think everybody knows about. And I, I was struck um, particularly by the uh, the residents because they were on on the news, the London news. Um, incredibly anxious. What I suppose. What Russ? What would you say needs to be what needs to be done to calm people's anxiety? Because it's clearly a, it's a very stressful subject um, for a lot of people in, particularly in tall buildings. So what, I suppose, what messaging needs to be out there? Yeah, well, you know, at the heart of the new proposed building safety bill is the requirement to have a tenant engagement strategy. Um, and I, I honestly believe that if you are going to reside in a tall building, be that social housing or be that a private privately owned, you're going to have to accept some degree of collective responsibility that um, hitherto has not been really uh, present in some of the buildings. So you're going to have to accept some degree of responsibility. Um, and, and I think from that, we need to say to people, 
You know, if you're going to live in a high rise building, it, it, for me, it's the same as a, a cruise ship tipped on its end. Uh, and you only need one hole in a cruise ship and it sinks. <laughs> so we only need one individual in a high rise building who's uh, exhibiting dangerous behavior. And I'm thinking, you know, barbecues on balconies, uh, people who may have a hoarding tendency, um, those kind of things. I think there is an inferred duty of care now to people. And we take the front door issue, for example, you know, we spent lots of time discussing who owns the front door, who's the fire status of the front door. I hope that's very clear now that the, the, the front door of a flat in a high rise building is, is essentially essential to the integrity of the fire safety compartmentation of the building. So what I'd be saying to people in high rise buildings is they are fantastic, amazing, opportunities to live in cities and have extraordinary views and you know proximity so i'm a big fan of tall buildings i always have been um, um, but i think i would say to them if you're going to live in a tall building then you have to accept some degree of um, inferred responsibility uh, and you can't just shut your door now and, and think that you're living on the ground floor like a normal domestic dwelling so uh, i'd be saying to people now having worked in in sao paulo in brazil for example, um, in a high rise building, you know, they have to 10% of the occupants of that building have to undertake mandatory fire safety training every year. Now, I come back to England and, and talk to people in social health and they laugh at me and say that we could never do that. It's impossible. Nobody would tolerate that. Well, Sao Paulo is pretty challenging as a, as, as a place to live. If they can do it, why can't we do it? So I think I'd be saying a positive message. Tall buildings are great to live in. Uh, but if you live in a tall building, you've got you've got a bit of responsibility and don't just leave it to the firefighters and everybody else. You've got to engage. Uh, and if you do that, you'll probably have a safe building. Is there a duty in that case on contractors coming in and out? Um, we, we often hear it from the from the passive fire protection side, particularly from the uh, the ASFP, that there is almost like a duty for contractors to almost like maintain competency around fire stopping. So is, is that another message that needs to be maybe more voluble and spread yeah. wider. I mean, Andy, Andy was quite right when he was talking about EN54. You know, you know, I think of, of active systems like sprinklers, you know, and the Red Book uh, and, and the, the hoops that, that those contractors have to jump through and compare and contrast that to other aspects of life safety systems. And uh, the contrast is just too marked. Uh, and, and I think, you know, I have got criticisms of, of, of some of the things that have come out from the Hackett reforms, but I think she's absolutely on the money with the competency issue. Uh, it's just unacceptable now not to be able to demonstrate and show competence uh, if you're dealing with any life safety system. And if you're, a, if you're an engineer installing um, a satellite dish on the side of a, and you've got to run a cable through three floors and two walls, then for me, it's absolutely vital that you know what you're doing to the fire compartmentation and you make damn sure that you fix it as you go. And don't use the high right the, the uh, dry riser. Yeah, we've seen it. <laughs> so it's almost like stopping the shortcuts, making sure that those contractors are aware of what they're doing. So there's there's, there's probably a bigger picture here, isn't there? I suppose that needs to be looked at across the construction piece. Um, on construction, we've had another question: Are balconies and their design being looked at in regards to the design of the building and fire safety, Richard? <laughs> Yeah, I believe balconies have been considered as part of one of the uh, groups that's looking at the review of A, approved document B. So balconies will be considered as part of that. I talked about in terms of risk assessment, they should also be considered as part of the fire risk assessment as well. Perfect, that's a great answer. And Andy, one for you. What about voice um, assistant evacuation systems? Could they become, excuse the word, mandatory? <laughs> um, well, there was a discussion recently in the Fire Industry Association where I raised the comment of, wouldn't it be better to have voice? Um, because the scope of 8629 at the moment excludes voice. That doesn't mean it couldn't be used. It just means it isn't considered. Um, what the, the, the fire FIA meeting concluded that, that uh, pre-recorded messages could be helpful. Um, because don't forget, they're not just a message. You still get the alarm tone. So you get, Nino, Nino, please get out of the building. That's got to be better than Nino, 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 with no, no information, even if you, English isn't your first language. Um, what there was a pushback on was the thought of using a voice alarm, which, is, which would be with live speech. Um, 
And I still think that could and should be considered. Um, but I do accept that it is more complex, not least of which is in the training of people to make live announcements. Uh, it's not necessarily, a, a, you don't expect the fire and rescue service necessarily to be trained to be able to do that effectively. So yes, voice would be a good idea, um, but it's not, as with all these things, not necessarily a simple black or white question. Of course, yeah, of course. Um, Russ, one thing, because I'm mindful of time, um, we've kind of got five minutes left. Um, I just wanted to come back to um, the work that you do. So I know recently you've had a, a panel discussion with a, a number of, uh, of, of chiefs from around the world. Do, do you see um, a movement towards a more global approach and, and sharing of best practice? Uh, well, I, I really hope so. Um, because, of the, because of the work of some people uh, on this particular issue, it's, 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 always, uh, it's always interesting to see how different people are doing different things. So uh, at the meeting, just for example, um, uh, just talking in pure firefighting terms, the, one of the issues with dry risers that's now been identified is, is if they, once they're checked and tested, the, the internal diameter can, can corrode and erode and, and produce lots of flakes of debris. Um, and when you pressurize it to do firefighting, if you use a normal hand control branch for firefighting, that can very quickly become clogged with dry rise of debris uh, and not work effectively. So many brigades, many uh, departments around the world now are transiting to smooth bore nozzles uh, for high rise firefighting. Now, um, so that, you know, you become aware of these discussions and how people have moved on through experience uh, and it's, and it's, and door curtains. I showed you those door curtains earlier on that have been in use on the continent for 10 years and, and we're only just starting to experiment with them. So I, I think in a sense of humility after what's happened, I think we should perhaps look at, look around the world and really capture those, those great, um, improvements and, and developments that they've made because um, my, my, my view is that you know some, some countries um, are way ahead of us um, and we should learn from that. No problem. Try and shut that off. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be busy. <laughs> um, one final thing I just wanted to, um, to, to, to ask the, the panel really was the um, so part of the recommendations now is that the HSC has got more of a role in, in, in what seems to be, you know, building safety. What, what do you think the actual role of the Chief Inspector of Buildings will, will influence and change? Richard, have you got a view on that, particularly from an HSE point? Well, it won't just be the Chief Inspector of Buildings. They'll be overseeing a whole new building safety regime. So that'll have um, additional uh, requirements of these buildings, things like the building safety case and having building safety managers in place should have that on-site oversight of um, safety within those buildings. Um, so things like I mentioned earlier, things like people coming to do um, install things like satellite dishes, there'll be um, proper work routes to oversee that kind of work, be aware of it, uh, make sure it happens properly. And also the residents will have some a contact point to um, uh, their issues. So Russ talked about kind of whole building responsibility. Um, having kind of contact points will help towards that as well. Yeah, it does I mean it does seem to me from what we said today that the the impact on the residents is, is becoming quite important, you know, particularly in their influence as well. So I think moving forward you can almost you can almost envisage a building by building culture, mm. I would imagine on, on particularly on, on life safety. So um, it, it'd be incredibly interesting to see how this um, how this how this will go. Um, I'm getting my I'm getting my warnings now that um, we've we've got to we've got to wrap up shortly. So um, I think that's it really. Our, our time has unfortunately come to an end. So I'd like to thank everybody on the panel today. It's been um, incredibly uh, illuminating for sure. It's been really interesting to hear about the uh, the the evacuation systems, Andy. So I think that's a really positive step forward. And um, Russ, once again, thanks for your your um, forensic insights into um, into what's going on, and, and Richard, it's brilliant to hear from the fire chiefs as well to get a view from from what's going on from that particular sector. Um, we'd like to thank also uh, Securiton um, for their support, and uh, we recommend that after this strat talk, um, please visit the Securiton booth via the exhibitor list uh, to view their detection and alarm solutions. 
Um, within the next 24 to 48 hours, uh, today's discussion uh, should be available to watch back on demand and on the FireX Connect, pla Connect platform. So please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been available to listen to the event and get them involved in FireX Connect. The FireX Connect platform will be open until the 30th of June. So please browse exhibitors for all your fire safety requirements and questions and make sure you use the meeting request option to set up an opportunity to meet with them or you can do a business card drop off to leave your, your details and they'll get back to you. So that's really it. So many, many thanks for watching. Thanks again to the panel. Uh, really appreciate your time and input and, and for the presentations. Uh, we hope we've provided you with some practical and relevant insights into the evacuation of tall buildings. That's all we have for today. So goodbye for now and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>